Hello Year 7s and welcome to Lessons 22 to 25 of your Boy Scheme of Work. Now today we're going to be looking at Captain Hardcastle to begin with, but don't forget you need a copy of Boy, whether that's the online PDF or that's the audiobook, maybe you've got a physical copy of the autobiography, you could use that as well. And you will also need your workbook that can be found on Show My Homework, but hopefully you've been working on that um, since the beginning of the unit and therefore we'll either have it printed off or we'll have it saved to your files. Now, as you can see today, our learning objective is to analyse the cap character of Captain Hardcastle and that's what we're going to be doing in today's lesson. Okay, so the first thing that I need you to do is read the chapter. So that's the chapter titled Captain Hardcastle. And you can see on this slide, I've got a picture of Captain Hardcastle. And in your copy of Boy, there's the chapter there for you. Now, what I would like you to do is place particular attention on the way that Captain Hardcastle is described and think about the language and structure techniques that you can identify whilst reading. So pause this video now. You need to read the chapter titled Captain Hardcastle and see how you get on with that. Okay, now that you've read the chapter, you're going to be focusing again more carefully on the opening description of Captain Hardcastle. And we're going to be thinking about this question. How does Roald Dahl make him sound unpleasant before we even realise that he's the antagonist in this chapter? Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is Miss talking about? What is an antagonist? And an antagonist is the opposite to a protagonist. So a protagonist is a hero, it's the main character in a story, and therefore the antagonist is the villain. Now, you might know if I use Harry Potter as an example, we've got Harry he's the protagonist as opposed to Voldemort who's the antagonist and those of you that have seen the Hunger Names Hunger Games will know that Katniss Everdeen she's the protagonist of that, that series of novels whereas President Snow he's the antagonist if you think about that word antagonist you might use it to describe somebody who causes a lot of arguments you might say that they are antagonistic and that means that they start a lot of arguments and they cause lots of problems with people so it's really important that you know those two words there protagonist and antagonist and we're going to be thinking about Captain Hardcastle and how we can tell right from the beginning of this chapter that he's going to be the villain he's going to be the bad guy before we even find out the sort of things that he does so in your workbook look, you've got the opening of that um, chapter and you've got a description of Captain Hardcastle I'm going to be reading it out now and I'd like you to have a think whilst I'm reading it what phrases stick out for you and if you've got your um, your copy of the workbook on a word document on your computer or your laptop you could highlight here and again if you've got a physical copy you could highlight the words and phrases that stand out to you so this man was slim and wiry and he played football on the football field he wore white running shorts and white gym shoes and short white socks his legs were as hard and as thin as ram's legs and the skin around his calves was almost exactly the color of mutton fat the hair on his head was not ginger it was brilliant dark vermilion like a ripe orange and it was plastered back with immense qualities of brilliantine in the same fashion as the headmaster's the parting on his hair was a white line straight down the middle of the scalp so straight it could only have been made with a ruler on either side of the parting you could see the comb tracks running back through the greasy orange hair like tram lines captain hardcastle sported a moustache that was the same colour as his hair and oh what a moustache it was a truly terrifying sight a thick orange hedge that sprouted and flourished between his nose and his upper lip and ran clear across his face with the middle of one cheek to the middle of the other but this was not one of those nail brush moustaches all sh short and clipped and bristly nor was it a long and droopy in the walrus style instead it was curled most splendidly upwards all the way along as though it had a permanent wave put into it or possibly curling tongs heated in the mornings over a tiny flame of methylated spirits the only other way he could have achieved this curling effect we boys decided was by prolonged upward brushing with a hard toothbrush in front of the looking glass every morning Okay, so hopefully you've highlighted or underlined some phrases there that stick out to you and that phrases that make him seem unpleasant right from the beginning. How do we know that this is going to be a very nice character? Now, obviously, we're giving a lot of detail about Captain Hardcastle's appearance in this part of the chapter. And I want you to have a think about what about his appearance seems quite unusual or even quite scary and quite strict. So it describes his hair as being um, like a ripe orange because of the colour of it. It's so bright orange. It's not even ginger. It's just bright, bright orange. Um, and it is, the parting has been made so straight that it looks like it's been made with a ruler. Not only that, but he's got this huge orange moustache that he's taken a lot of care into making making sure it's really curly. So we need to have a think, which phrases in this in this um, 
description make him seem like he's going to be very strict perhaps if he's very strict with his appearance you might think that he's going to be very strict with the boys at the school you could also think about the idea of his legs being hard and thin as ram's legs that simile there makes him sound quite strong maybe that his legs are hard but the fact that they're very thin relates maybe to the fact that he plays a lot of sport um maybe he's quite athletic and he's quite sporty now, I want you to start thinking now about elsewhere in the chapter. So I want you to think elsewhere in the chapter, where does Roald Dahl use the following structural techniques to present Hardcastle as the antagonist? Now, we've looked at these structural techniques in an earlier lesson, but just in case you don't remember what they mean. So we've got foreshadowing, contrast, dialogue and motifs. I want you to think foreshadowing. Where do you first know that Boy is going to be punished? Or where are there hints before Roald Dahl was actually punished? Where are there hints earlier on in the chapter? Chapter that Captain Hardcastle likes to punish students. Then have a think about the contrast that's used. So who is kind to Boy, making Hardcastle seem even worse? Are there any teachers at the school that are kind to Roald Dahl? And how does that make Hardcastle seem even worse and even stricter? Perhaps maybe you can think of some teachers that you know at school that are really kind, and then that makes the stricter teachers at school look even stricter. And, and I've, I've had so-and-so say, oh, um, that teacher lets me get away with it, and then that makes you look really mean. So there's a the use of contrast for you there. Then I want you to have a think about dialogue. So what does he say or what does Captain Har what is said about Captain Har Car Castle that makes um, us strengthen our dislike for him? So have a think. What does he say? The way that he speaks to people and the way that people speak to him. Perhaps everybody's really, really polite to him, but he's really rude and up blunt and abrupt to others. So I want you to think about that use of dialogue in the chapter because dialogue, just speech, is a structural technique as well. And then finally, I want you to think about motifs. So what is constantly mentioned about Boy to make him sound vulnerable in this chapter? And there's something in this chapter that gets repeated over and over again that makes Boy or Roald Dahl seem particularly vulnerable and makes it seem like Captain Hardcastle is being very unfair. So think about those four techniques. Can you spot any of them? You will need to pause the video. And as I've mentioned in a previous video, trying to find structural techniques is often a little bit harder than trying to find language techniques. And it's really, really good that you're trying to spot them in year seven, because then when you go, go up to year 11, it would be such a shock to you when you're asked and you're told that you have to find structural techniques. So try and spot those. Like I said, pause the video if you need to. Go through the chapter about Captain Hardcastle and answer those four questions on this slide. Now, in your workbook, you've got a really helpful table. It takes up a whole page on page 56. And I would like you to use that table to plan two language devices and two structural devices. You're going to spot them and then you're going to think about the effect of them. And you're going to try and answer this question. So how is Captain Hardcastle presented in this part of the novel? And there's a little note for you on here. It says, remember, how means deliberate writer's methods. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be picking two language devices and two structural devices that are used to answer that question. So to rephrase the question, we want to try and find out what has the writer deliberately done in their writing to make us understand the kind of character Captain Hardcastle is. So as I've said earlier, Captain Hardcastle is an antagonist. You're going to find two language techniques and two structural techniques that show us that he is the antagonist. And there's one that's been done there for you. So you've got it on your table, the use of the simile there. So that's one of the language techniques that's been found for you. So you need to just find three now. Um, the, the simile that's been chosen is the hair on his head was not ginger. It was brilliant, dark vermilion, like a ripe orange. And you can see that in the box on that table, there's some analysis. And it says that the adjective dark makes him sound sinister. And the focus on ginger, vermilion and orange are all colours like a traffic light saying warning or stop. This is not a person to cross. Do not proceed danger ahead. So the fact that Captain Hardcastle stands out amongst all the other people based on how um, bright his hair is suggests that we need to be wary of him and it's, he's something, somebody to be scared of. So I want you to go back to that list of structural devices if you need to. Feel free to just rewind the video a little bit. And you're going to pick two of those that you've spotted. Maybe it's dialogue and you could find a quotation from him from this chapter where he's really having a go at a student and he's being really harsh to them. Find that example of dialogue. Think about what it is that he says and how what he says is really harsh and blunt and maybe quite antagonistic. 
and then find another language technique as well. Maybe that's personification. It could be that simile that I used earlier about his legs being as hard and as thin as Ram's legs. And I want you to try and complete that table. And this table is going to help you plan to answer this question later on this lesson. So pause the video, find another language technique. It could be a simile or you could try and find a metaphor or some personification or in a different language technique and then two structural techniques that you spotted earlier this lesson as well. OK, now what you're going to try and do now is turn your table into a PQA and you can see the first row on this table. As I said, it's been done for you. And there's also an example in your workbook of what your PQA should look like. So you've got three more PQAs to write because the first one has been done for you. And I'm going to read out the example there and you can see the way that it has been color coded for you. So the writer uses similes to, uh, uses a simile sorry, to present Captain Hardcastle. He is described as the hair on his head was not ginger, it was a brilliant dark vermilion like a ripe orange. The use of the adjective dark makes him sound sinister, associated with something fearful or intimidating. As well as this, the focus on ginger, vermilion and orange are all colours like a traffic light, indicating a warning or to stop. The writer is trying to help us understand that Captain Hardcastle is not a person to cross. You should not approach him or get too close or you will be in danger. So you can see there's a PQA there for you. The P is in red, the Q is in green, and then the your analysis, your A, is in blue. And I'd like you to follow that structure to help you write about your other three techniques. So you could say, furthermore, he uses another simile to present Captain Hardcastle as an antagonist. He is described as having legs that are thin and hard as a ram's. And then think about the fact that a ram maybe is quite strong, quite powerful. You wouldn't want to cross it. And the fact that he compares him to a ram, it's not like he's comparing him to a cuddly dog or um, a uh, another animal that you'd like to snuggle up to it's a ram so it's got horns maybe you have to be really careful of it because it because it could hurt you so you're going to go now you've got space to finish in to fill in your three pqas there i'd like you to use the table that you planned earlier and consider the structure and the language devices that are used by the writer especially to make captain hardcastle appear to be an antagonist okay so find those quotations that you spotted earlier and you're going to follow that structure, use the example one to help you to write your own three PQAs. When you've done that, you finish this lesson. So you can pause the video here, take a break, maybe come back to the video later on, or you can finish this for, for today and come back to the next lesson tomorrow. OK, so welcome back. And we are back to doing some narrative writing in this lesson. So you'll remember last week we did the narrative writing on someone pretending to be sick. This week, our learning objective is to practice our narrative writing in relation to Captain Hardcastle or Ellis and the Boyle. So you're going to be doing a narrative writing challenge again today. So we're going to be reading the very next, um, sorry, the next very, very short chapter. So it shouldn't take you very, very long to read. And part of the chapter is a little bit gross. So the chapter title is called Little Alice and the Boil. And just in case you're stuck and you've never heard of what a boil is before, most boils are caused by a germ. So the germ enters the body through tiny cuts in the skin or can travel down the hair to the follicle. They are more painful and more infection than regular spots. So you might have had a spot before that looks particularly angry those spots can be caused and can develop into a boil and boils are caused by a germ so when the germ enters the body through tiny cuts in the skin um, it creates an infection um, and uh, you can see here that the germ is caused by the bacteria staphylococcal bacteria so the this chapter is about little Ellis and the boil this little boy Ellis he's got a boil that's quite bad now I'm not going to tell you to Google it, but if you want to Google to check what a boil is, be prepared. It's really, really gross. I'm not going to tell you you can. I'm not going to tell you you can, but if that's something that might interest you. Maybe you've got a strong stomach, then feel free to Google boils and see what comes up. So now that you've read that chapter, I want you to think about this question. So who do you think is most unfairly treated? Roald Dahl or Little Ellis? So who do you think is most unfairly treated? So feel free to write your ideas down in your work booklet. Think about um, why you think Boy or Ellis is treated most unfairly. But I want you to think about that question. Who do you think is treated most unfairly? Boy or Roald Dahl? Sorry, Roald Dahl or Ellis? 
Okay, now your task for today is going to be write a story about somebody who is treated unfairly. Okay, so you're going to be thinking about somebody who's treated unfairly. So what I'd like you to do first is just have a kind of a rough idea. Maybe you can think about some examples of times that you've been treated unfairly. Maybe you know of instances where people at school have been treated unfairly. Then I'd like you to do a spider diagram and you've got space to do that in your um, work booklet. So you're going to be writing down some ideas. Who in your story is going to be treated unfairly? Who are they going to be untreated unfairly by etc etc and then I want you to think about this last thing what questions might we ask to help us create a narrative so to help us create a story what questions are you going to need to ask yourself to help you develop your story in detail so maybe as I said who is the person why have they been treated unfairly are they going to be treated fairly at the end is the person going to apologize now you might know of a very very famous case in America at the moment where someone has been treated in incredibly unfairly and that is a man called George Floyd so you hopefully you've been watching the news hearing about the events that have happened in America and you'll know about George Floyd who was um he was killed um, because police officers were detaining him and they were stood on his neck and he effectively suffocated um, because he was being detained in a quite a violent manner. So obviously George Floyd is someone who's been treated very, very unfairly. Um, you could write something about so along the same lines. Um, just does the person get justice in the end? How do people react to that person being treated unfairly? So when you think about all of these things, write your story. It could just be something as simple as um, siblings are being treated unfairly by their parents it's up to you to decide how deep and how interesting you want your story to be now you can see on this slide here we've got the typical writing challenge slide there for you so your goal task is to write a story about somebody who's treated unfairly you've got some methods that i'd like you to try and include and also a vocabulary challenge there as well i'm going to be explaining um later on this lesson what the vocabulary means as well the techniques I'd like you to include, now I've spoken about foreshadowing over and over again in this scheme of work, so hopefully you know fully what foreshadowing is at this point. If you're stuck there and you'll still have no idea what I'm talking about, then listen very carefully now. So foreshadowing is when we hint at future events in a story. So these can act as a warning or for what is to come later on in the story. So there's an example on here for you. The first time I knew he was not to be trusted was the day of the fair. And then another example, my day had been going so well. So there's some hints there for you that something bad is going to happen later on. My day had been going so well, not my day is going so well. My day had been going so well. So we know that that's past tense. It's not going well anymore. And then also the first time I knew he was not to be trusted was the day of the fair. So there's a hint there that it's going to be a character later on that is one that's untrustworthy. So think about the foreshadowing in your story that hints at future events that are going to happen later. So maybe somebody treats somebody else unfairly, but it's just something small. But then later on, they treat the, your main character very unfairly and um, it's a bigger thing. So that there was foreshadowing there earlier on in the story. The next method I'd like you to try and include is contrast. So two opposite ideas or images in the story. An example there for you, the first time I met her, she had seemed so kind and helpful. Now she was deliberately being hostile. Hostile meaning quite hard to get along with, quite um, angry, maybe causing lots of conflict. So you can see that there's contrast between the kind and helpful and then hostile as well. So maybe one person's being treated really, really fairly and really kindly, but then the other person is being treated really unfairly. So you can decide there which one, um, how you're going to use contrast in your story. So contrast and foreshadowing, they are both structure techniques. We've also got a language technique that I'd like you to try and include, and that is simile. So similes are comparative descriptive phrases using like or as. So he has been like a brother to me, or the pain was like a spear piercing my leg. So maybe what's happening in that bit where, where someone's being treated unfairly. And if you want to use any of these sentences for your own um, story, then of course you can. Just make sure that you include them in your story in a way that it makes sense to the story that you are writing. And all of these methods are in your workbook as well. So if you are stuck, there's the description in your workbook as well. Okay, and I'd also like you to try and include some personification. So that is to give something human characteristics. 
Um, so it's something that isn't a human, you're giving them human characteristics. So the school bell called me inside. The school bell can't actually call somebody and say, hey, you, come on, come inside. But that's personification. And the weather pointed to a disaster. So that's also there, that last example there is also an example of pathetic fallacy. You might remember that one. We spoke about that before when you're using the weather to convey a mood or an emotion. So have a think, how could you use maybe pathetic fallacy and personification in your story? I'd also like you to try and use some emotive language. So language used to evoke feelings, often sympathy, but could also be pride or affection. So I've got some examples. I clutched my aching head. I tried not to cry as my lip trembled and heat crept across my face. So maybe you're going to make the reader feel really sympathetic towards your and your protagonist because you feel really sorry that they've been treated in this really unfair way. Um, maybe you could make the by using emotive language, you could make your reader feel really angry about the way that your antagonist is behaving. OK, so think about how you're going to make your reader feel emotions for the characters in your story. And then last but not least, I'd like you to try and use a question mark. So punctuation used for questions and queries. So why had I trusted them? That's a good rhetorical question there for you. It's a question that somebody's asking themselves. They don't need an answer. But you can also use question in dialogue. So that example there, what do you want? That sounds really blunt and abrupt, doesn't it? Maybe your antagonist could be asking that to your protagonist, treating them really unfairly. Perhaps you could write about a group of friends that the leader of the group of friends is excluding one of the friends and uh, makes them feel like they shouldn't belong in. They're not part of that group. That would be a really good story for you to write about someone being treated unfairly. OK, so before you start writing your stories, I'd like you to use the boxes that you have in your workbook now to begin to plan your use of writers methods for this writing challenge. So you've got all of the definitions in your workbook as well. You can use some of the examples that have been given with those definitions, but try and think of some examples for yourself as well. And you'll need to refer back to your spider diagram plan from earlier in the lesson to help you plan this story and think about where you want it to go and how you're going to use those techniques. You'll also see that in your um, workbook, you've got the vocab challenge and the definitions there so the word malefactor meaning a bad person it's a noun so you could say um the malefactor drew closer to me so the malefactor came closer i could feel his breath on the back of my neck maybe something like that you've also got that adjective there unjust which means to be unfair and then also the adverb there reluctantly um so to do something reluctantly means without wanting to so i want you to have a think about those techniques i want you to try and tick them off and include them as you go you'll get have some time now to plan your use of writers methods for the challenge and then you can tick them off as you write your story and as you include them when you've done that, you can pause the video and then you should be spending around about 40 minutes writing your story on those next two pages. So it's really important that you invest some time in this. And if you write a particular piece of work that you're very proud of, feel free to email it to your English teacher. I'm sure they'd love to see it. But that way you can show them kind of this is the hard work that I've been doing at home and they'd love to get in touch with you. I know lots of you are missing that contact with your teachers and seeing your teachers every day. So by emailing the piece of work that you've done, I'm sure they'd love to see it and love to be able to give you some feedback on it. So pause the video now and your task is to write a story about somebody who is treated unfairly using all of those techniques that we've talked about, using your plan from earlier on in the lesson and then thinking about those, that vocabulary as well. Now that you've written your story, I'd like you to try and self-assess it. So as always, with a piece of work, an extended piece of writing, we should be reflecting on it, thinking about what we've done well and what we could do to improve it. So I'd like you to highlight and label all of the methods that you've used in your piece of work. Maybe you could colour code the techniques that you've used, those six on the slide in front of me. And you could circle any errors that you find. Maybe if you've got someone at home that would be willing to do that for you, feel free to ask them to have a look through it and see if they can find any errors. Give yourself a what went well and an even better if maybe or what went well could be that you've included some of those techniques but your even better if was that maybe you didn't know how to include foreshadowing for example and then I'd like you to sign and date your self-assessment so you could just put a date at the bottom so that you can remember when you look back on your workbook the date that you completed this and the date that you attempted this task.
again and the last lesson um, of this video is the lesson referring to the chapter titled goats tobacco and your learning objective is to practice our speaking and listening in relation to boy now this lesson is a bit of a sad one for me because what the lesson was supposed to have been was a debate that would take place in class with your classmates however as we can't do that we're obviously not in class you can have a very lonely debate by yourself but it wouldn't be as good what we're going to be doing instead is you're going to be having a go at writing a speech and putting together some ideas based on this chapter um, with regards to Roald Dahl and the type of child that he was. So we're still going to be practicing our speaking and listening, but instead of having a debate, you're going to be working on a speech. So I want you to have a think. How many naughty things has Roald Dahl, or boy as we know him from the autobiography, how many naughty things has he done so far? And I want you to try and make a list. And there are five spaces on that. I bet you can think of more than five. There are five spaces in your workbooklet. Can you make a list? You might need to flick through. You might need to scroll through or rewind the audiobook. How many naughty things has he done so far? Now, I can think of quite a few of them just off the top of my head. So I want you to try and do the same. How many naughty things has Roald Dahl done we've read about so far in the autobiography? Now that you've done that, I'd like you to think about reading the next chapter. And this chapter is titled Goat's Tobacco. And there's a there's a hint there when you look at the pictures on my PowerPoint slides, uh, a hint of what's to come. But if you haven't read the chapter yet, then that's what you need to do now. I want you to read the chapter titled Goat's Tobacco. And I want you to think about that question that I just asked you. How many naughty things has boy done? Can you add any more to it based on this chapter? Any more to your list from earlier? OK, now, hopefully you read the chapter and you enjoyed it. I have to admit, I was laughing as I was reading it. It's quite a funny one. You can just imagine the smell that, and the taste of the goat's goat's tobacco, as Roald Dahl calls it. Now, he includes this episode because it is funny. It is a funny um, story. And as I said, it just made me laugh. Hopefully it made you laugh as well. And Aristotle and Plato, they are really, really famous Greek philosophers. They said that all humour is derived from the misfortunes of others. And when you think about that quotation there, all humour is derived from the misfortunes of others. Do you agree? Are things funny? when something bad happens to somebody else or are there other types of humour? So let's think about that question. Do you agree? In this case, it is Roald Dahl's um, half sister's boyfriend that or fiance that um, the bad thing happens to. It's his misfortune. But I want you to think it, it does all humour derive from the misfortune of, of others. And those of you that like programmes like You've Been Framed and you like watching funny compilation videos on YouTube of people slipping and falling over, you might be the sort of person that's definitely going to agree with this one and say that humour is derived from the misfortune of others. And it's really funny when bad things happen to other people. So I want you to think about this question. Now, using your list of naughty incidents from boys so far, you're going to have a go at writing a speech with this title. So Roald Dahl was a very naughty child. I want you to think about, do you agree or disagree with that argument? And you're going to be writing a speech to explain your view. So Roald Dahl was a very naughty child. Agree or disagree. Now, in order to help you plan your speech, you're going to use the table that's in your work booklet, sides for agree and sides for disagree. So I want you to have a Think about those two sides. Do you agree that Roald Dahl is a very naughty boy or do you disagree? Do you think actually he wasn't a very naughty child at all? Now, you have got that list from earlier and that list is going to help you with the agree side that he was a very naughty child. But you can also think of some other ideas. Does he only do things to people who deserve it? Does, does he what he does is funny and he does it for a laugh not to actually cause any pain or torment maybe think about what he did to mrs pratchett did he feel guilty afterwards that might help you with the disagree side maybe he's not a very naughty child because he um felt some shame and some guilt afterwards so i want you to fill in the two sides of that table um what's important to remember is that you've got lots of evidence in your in the copy of boy so you might need to flick through it to help you fill in those two tables also think about all of the bad things that happened to roll dark so him receiving the cane, for example, him having very horrible teachers and the matron not being very nice to him. Think about those. Is, is he naughty in those cases? Does he deserve the punishments that he gets? Maybe think about the fact that he pretended to be poorly as well. Is that naughty? Have you done that before? Is that not naughty? So I want you to fill out these two sides of the table and they're going to help you with the speech that you're going to be writing later on this lesson.
Okay, and now I need you to write your speech. I need you to answer this question. Was Roald Dahl a very naughty child? Do you agree or disagree? And you could start with, um, I agree that Roald Dahl was a very naughty child and then explain your reasons. But don't forget when you are writing a speech and you looked at a lot of speeches when you um, looked at Henry V, you should be aiming to use the techniques from a red forest. And they're on this slide to help you just in case you get stuck. So I want you to see if you can try and include as many of these techniques as possible. Was Roald Dahl a very naughty child? Do you agree or disagree? Now, if you're going to try and challenge yourself, you could try and think about an alternative viewpoint. Maybe you could write two or three paragraphs about how he was a naughty child and then one that argues that he wasn't. Or you could write um, all of your whole speech about how he is not a naughty child. It's entirely up to you based on your own viewpoint and I want you to think about maybe the fact that maybe he was naughty but maybe he was naughty in a funny way maybe that he did have some redeeming qualities so I'd like you to have a go at that um you will need to probably you'll need to use your workbook to do that so use your table from earlier think about the list that you have of um the naughty things that he did use your copy of boy to help you if you can but try and use as many techniques as you can from a red forest because they are going to help you make your speech entertaining and engaging now if you would like to practice your speech on anybody you want to sit at home and you want to um give your speech to maybe your parents or any siblings that you've got then of course please do that that'll be brilliant practice for speaking and listening furthermore if you'd like to record yourself doing your speech and you want to send that to one of your teachers I'm sure that will be viewed in a very very positive way and you might even be recommended for a hey teachers award so if you've written your speech and you're very pleased with it please do send it on to your teacher or feel free to record yourself giving it and your teacher might even nominate you for a head teachers award now before I finish you'll see that in your workbook that there is a challenge task there and um, only access this only have give this a go if you can if you've got able to access it and don't worry if you can't but just in case you are interested there is a podcast on BBC Sounds called Ro Russell Kane's Evil Genius so there's an episode on Roald Dahl there which talks about Roald Dahl's um, personality and the type of character that he was and actually was he the cuddly children's author that we all know or did he actually have a dark side to him now you're only allowed to watch this if you've been given permission by your parents because it does have some very strong language but you, if you are um, wanting to challenge yourself you might be interested in finding out a little bit more about the man behind boy and think about the role doll that actually existed was he um, evil or was he a genius so I want you to have a think about that if you are able to access the podcast or and if you've been given um permission by your parents and when you've done that you finish this series of lessons so really well done great work pause the video and relax